This is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahant. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. President Joe Biden signed several climate-related executive orders on his first day in office, including some that affect the residents of the Bering Sea. One of the orders reinstates the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience Area, an Obama-era protection from offshore oil and gas leasing in the Norton Sound and waters around St. Lawrence Island. The original order was revoked in the early months of Donald Trump's presidency. The reinstated order outlines policies on marine shipping, pollution, marine debris, and oil spills, among other Arctic issues. The American Library Association is announcing that the picture book, We Are Water Protectors, is a winner of the Caldecott Medal. Illustrated by Clinklet artist Michaela Goad and written by Turtle Mountain Ojibwe citizen Carol Lindstrom, the book follows a young female standing up against construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Michaela spoke with us about the book's importance. And we need the representation for our own communities but we also need non-Native people to see these books, to value these books, lift these books up, and not just in November for Native American Heritage Month, but all year. So um, this is, I think, a, a great step in that direction. This is the first time an Indigenous person has ever won the Caldecott Medal. With this visibility, their hope is that the picture book brings more awareness to environmental injustice. One blood tribe member in southwestern Alberta, Canada, is trying to make a difference in his community by using aquaponics. Aquaponics has been called a sustainable way to grow food. The way it works is the waste produced by your fish feeds the plants, and the plants clean the water for the fish. Dan McGinnis, the founder of Thunderbirds Farm in Alberta, says it comes down to basic living, and we need to help each other. Just, you know, take care of each other, be kind to each other, share. All the stuff you learned in kindergarten, <laughs> right? The goal is to have four greenhouses in his community because he wants to have sustainable living in his tribe. The Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa is supplying its own brand of hand sanitizer. They are based in Belcourt, North Dakota. A supply shortage at the start of the pandemic prompted tribal leaders to start the Bee Knee Company, which is developing the hand sanitizer. Raw hand sanitizer is being imported and the bottling, labeling, and distribution will take place at the Turtle Mountain Manufacturing Plant. The tribe has already received its first shipment and expects mass distribution to begin within the next few months. Chairman Jamie Azur says they are going to reach out across the country to anyone that feels left out of the supply chain. Tribal nations are first on their priority list. Azur says the first shipment smells like lemon, but not to worry, other scents are in the works. The Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, located near Scottsdale, Arizona, is asking Major League Baseball to delay the start of the season due to the coronavirus. The tribe owns Salt River Fields at Talking Stick, which sits on the western edge of tribal lands. It is currently home to the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Colorado Rockies during spring training. They made the request in a letter to baseball commissioner Rob Manfred. Along with the Cactus League, the letter is co-signed by the mayors of six Arizona towns as well as representatives from Phoenix. Currently, talks have stalled with no formal proposals to change opening day. According to Salt River's Facebook page, the tribe is approaching 1,600 coronavirus cases with 42 deaths since the start of the pandemic. NBC Universal Group launched a new journalism training program called NBCU Academy. The goal is to offer resources to universities and college colleges that are historically black, Hispanic serving institutions, and have a significant population of Latino, Asian, black, indigenous, or tribal communities. They are a team of journalists and producers, data wonks, human resource specialists, and business professionals who believe in the transformative power of radical candor to build inclusive and equitable newsrooms. New Mexico's Institute of American Indian Arts is one of 17 colleges picked to be a part of the program. IAIA was approached by NBCU Academy in late 2020. IAIA will receive $500,000 in grant money from the program over two years. The money will go towards scholarships, internships, and seminar courses with guests, including NBC journalists. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant. We'll be right back.
it's now been a year since the coronavirus was deemed serious enough for China to go into lockdown. Still reeling from the pandemic, we've changed the way we live and work. That's especially true for performing artists. Today, we meet two multimedia artists who found ways to collaborate across the miles. James, just game, James Pakotis is an award-winning producer and hip-hop artist, motivational speaker, and mentor who cultivates change in the world through the power of words. He's a citizen of the Colville Confederated Tribes and lives in Washington. Welcome, James. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, and Talon Bazil shoots the enemy, Dushino, is enrolled in the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. As a rap artist and poet of the Lakota Nation, his work has gone from res to city to res, reflecting his own mix of experience and views of the world through music. Welcome, Talon. Thank you for having me. With support from the First Peoples Fund, the two artists were able to meet. Tell us about that, Talon. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, both James and I, we uh, were one of the selected fellows to um, do, I believe mine was Cultural Capital Fellowship. I believe James was uh, Business Leadership. Yeah, uh, Artists and Business Leadership. Yep. yep, there we go. And, uh, you know, what First Peoples Fund was doing before the uh, coronavirus um, is we would get together in a artist convening or fellow convening and you know we're there in phoenix for maybe four to five days and as soon as me and james really got in each other's space we quickly kind of noticed each other's work ethic and artistic sides and you know eventually we went through with uh gunner jewels and tony louie and um, creating a song during that convening and really from then on me and james have just been in constant contact collaborating working with one another and that was definitely from that point on in 2019, how, you know, a lot of our projects today got started that we're still, you know, working on releasing and even planning for the future. That's incredible. J James, how have you been able to work with talent a thousand miles apart? <laughs> um, you know, a lot of Google Drive, a lot of passing uh, back and forth, uh, whether, they're, whether they're files of instrumentals or, or vocal files. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got the, the internet is, is, is a beautiful way to be able to collaborate with people no matter where they're at. And we do through uh, Zoom as well. So even if we're, we're, we're creating video content, we, we create conversations around the content we're creating, whether it's producing for film or making new projects, we're always in conversation and we're recording these Zoom, these Zoom calls and then um, editing them in post-production and then making them more digestible for people to hear. So, um, you know, really a lot of our work comes through Google Drive, being able to pass files back and forth, and then just uh, on Zoom, like right in real time, being able to share with each other uh, our feelings about the track or directions of how we want to move forward. So, yeah. How do you plan that? Do you start by having conversations about what you want out of a piece or do you just start jamming? Yeah, it's like... Um, we communicate all the time. So it's, it's every time an idea pops up, we're already in communication, you know, whether it's through Facebook messenger, Instagram, you know, DMS or jumping on zoom, like Talon and I will zoom like three or four times a week and we'll just conversate over, you know, what, what kind of stuff do you want to get going? Do you have, do you have any ideas for projects? Like right now we've got three collaborative projects um, together that we'll be doing. Um, you know, a duo album with him and I producing the tracks as well as doing all the vocals. And then we've got larger scope work of a whole collective of people um, all throughout Canada and U.S. Uh, that we're doing as well. So it's it's just constant communication and then just being 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 open with each other to share our ideas, share our dreams, share our visions and seeing how we can implement those visions with each other. No matter if I'm in Washington or he's in South Dakota, we just want to support each other. Boy, even a few years ago, if you wanted to do this kind of thing, you'd have to pick up and be gone a lot. Um, how, what's the economics of this? How does it work financially? <laughs> um, financial wise, I, I know me and James, we both kind of have our own way. And that's kind of the beautiful part of our collaboration is while we do work a lot together and we'll um, apply for grants with each other in mind or we'll go out there with our material together or, or promoting each other and all of that by and large you know how we I guess hustle 
our our work and and what we do it it really varies especially with this pandemic um for me it's a little iffy because i'll get kind of side gigs to perform virtually or uh you know i'll get asked by an organization to help produce a piece that they're working on or um right now i'm working on uh this thing called creation story with keith braveheart where I'm doing the sound engineering for an art exhibit that they want to do. That's about the Lakota creation story. With that funding um, and whatever comes out of that, just as James showed me in our residency that we did in 2019 together, um, where we recorded an Ikdomi series, a series on the trickster Ikdomi, um, it, it's about reinvesting all of that in and trying to get it another way to, to sustain something else because um, I feel like the more that we have been reinvesting, the more not just you know better our art becomes, but as James said before, our goals with this really are to uplift our community and not just by us talking about it, but by us showing those actions through um, how we conduct our work and how you know James will involve all of the youth and, and artists in his area who he believes in, in and wants to shine with the artists that I have coming from my network of people who I've seen throughout you know my 10 plus years in this music game of you know the artists who inspired me and had me on their music when I was just a freshman in high school and they were in their late 20s to the new artists now who now the, the roles flipped and you know I'm I'm that older you know uncle you know trying to show nephew and niece how to do this and um so really when it comes to finances I know for me, it, it's it's kind of just a toss up in the air. A lot of people, given what we're doing, I think they think that it's very um, uh, monetary heavy, and you get all this stuff. But really, it's it's a it's a big labor of love for both of us. And if anything, the the payment is you know those connections that we're talking about, and those moments when artists come to us and they share that good positive energy, or or the listener, or the event and organizers that we work with um it's it's really about that yeah and as for me like you said we we take different approaches as far as you know um uh, bookings go and engagements and whatnot early on uh right when covid broke we're back in like february right february april 2020 and uh and i realized we were not going to have the same access to cinematographers videographers or even other artists you know we had to really think early like okay how are we going to adapt and the, and the key word for, 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 for the pandemic is pivot, right? How are we going to pivot? How are we going to adapt? And early on, I was like, you know, I need to start doing film myself. You know, I'm not going to have access to these people. So um, I, I just at first upgraded my phone to a, to a Samsung S20, like the nicest phone with the nicest camera on the market at that time. Got a phone gimbal and just started getting some hours behind even learning what a camera does on a phone. You know, first doing my own promo videos and quickly uh, took a booking from First People's Fund um, in partnership with, with one of their native CDFIs here in Washington um, called the Native uh, uh, Northwest Native Development um, uh, Firm. And, uh, and, and I shot 13 short documentaries with, with a good friend of mine, Roxanne Best, of 13 different performing artists up here. So it wasn't so much of me being the one in the forefront. It was just sharing story and giving other people opportunity, right? Um, still trying to build community in this this new way, this virtual way, right? And uh, and and in doing so, um, have have been able to 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 keep a roof over my head. And then the other half of it is all of the grant writing, so grants and fellowships. I'm very you know heavily involved in writing grants. My partner Maura Garcia like really taught me how to how to really develop a system um, to save my content and 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 get to get to writing more often, right? So. Uh, you know, 2020 came and I'm um, uh, 2021 um, Advancing Indigenous Performance uh, Fellow through Western Arts Alliance. Right now you're seeing this beautiful space. I'm rounding off the end of this uh, three and a half week residency here at Caldera Arts, uh, DCM Collective, which Talon is a part of. Um, you know, five of us from the collective got an opportunity to be here for three and a half weeks to develop content for the next year. Um, and in that film, we're, we're getting into more film projects. Talon and I just won a huge award at LA Skins Fest for being able to score an animated short, right? So we, so we got the Achievement in Animation Award at LA Skins Fest. So we're really pivoting more, not just being performance art, but 
um, uh, being producers as well and getting into film. So it's really like the, the theme of the pandemic for us is adaptation and, and, and really getting heavily, uh, getting our hands heavily involved in, in the freelance work. It's interesting. That's almost the long story of uh, indigenous America's adaptation for the last three centuries, figuring out new ways to do things. I, yeah. I'm curious, how do your fans react to this? Uh, I've taken my fans on a roller coaster ride since the beginning, right? Like I've, I've, I've had all of this uh, success, you know, through First Peoples Fund. They've sent me all over the nation. Met with Talon down in Phoenix. We recorded there. Again, we went down to National Performance Network's booking conference down in New Orleans, and then we recorded two more songs while we were holding space together. And then First Peoples Fund sends us up to APAP in New York City. And I got to meet with the Doris Duke Foundation and recorded two more songs with, you know, Defy and, and Los, you know, other people that, that, that we collaborate with now on a regular basis. And, uh, and, and, <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, the, the building of that resilience is, is I feel like my, my fans and my followers um, have come to know me for that resilience. I've lived a very a tough life, tumultuous life, you know, the childhood trauma and then not being able to deal with it or, or, or choosing not to deal with it and, and, and going into uh, alcohol addiction, drug addiction and criminal activity and then bouncing back and my community forgiving me for the, for the wrongs that I did to my own community, for the poisons I, I, I gave to my own community. Um, they've really um, um, come to know me for that resilience, right? And I've done, and I've done so in my music as well. Started out with "Break These Chains," we won the Native American Music Award, and then the next song I dropped was an R&B song, and then the next song was, you know, me and my friend Tony doing like hip hop and blues influenced, you know. So, like my my fans, they 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 know me for the adaptation, they know me for the resilience. So really, a lot of them have been very very supportive, you know, along the way, and 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 inspired, you know, because I'm. I'm not afraid to try new things, like start over and, 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 and find a new beginning. You know, like, like I, I just take the, the thought of no matter where I'm at, like I feel my ancestors with me, no matter, no matter where I'm at in art or business, like I have, I have resilience for hundreds of years built up in my spirit, you know? So I take that with me everywhere I go. Fantastic. Thank you, James Pakotas for joining us. I appreciate you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Talon Bazil Schutz, the enemy Dushino, for joining us as well. Oh, thank you very much. And and if I could just say one last thing, you know, a lot of this, we can't separate these things from ancestry and tradition. We're very about breaking down the whole modern versus tradition dichotomy and, and duality. And I say that because I, I mentioned before we got on that I, I saw you when I was younger and I, I specifically remember going up to shake your hand because you showed me at a young age, just like many of our ancestors, that there can be a sophistication and an, a real intelligence to radicalism and radical art in the way that we present things and, and do it with love. And, and you showed me that and with our music. That's kind of what we're, that, that really is what we're trying to do. It, it's with passion and spirit and, and tradition, but with a sophistication and a way of, of doing it that says, you know, it, it's more than just a feeling. It's more than, than just what it is. It, it extends to so many different things, be it our voice, a song, whatever. And you, you really showed me that when I was a young person. So, so thank you. I, I'm honored by that. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Strengthening tribal relationships and upholding tribal sovereignty is a priority of President Joe Biden. He's been busy since taking office since taking office last week. 
One person following the president's actions is Jordan Bennett Begay. She's our deputy managing editor and is based in Washington, D.C. Her recent story, Joe Biden, Tribal Sovereignty Will Be a Cornerstone, is on our website now. Jordan joins us now to talk more about the president's actions. Hello, Jordan. Hi, Mark. Thanks for joining us. So what's the latest development in Washington? Oh, a lot's been happening uh, with this uh, Biden administration in the last week. Um, as we know, on this first day, um, first day on the job, he, um, you know, revoked the permit for a Keystone pipeline. He put a temporary um, mortuarium on the drilling in the Arctic Wildlife National Refuge. Um, and also a number of things like yesterday, um, he signed four executive orders that were part of his racial equity plan. Um, and one of those orders was, you know, respect for tribal sovereignty. And so this executive order was actually a presidential memorandum and it requires all federal agencies and executive departments to have a strong process in place for tribal consultation. Um, I spoke with Libby Washburn and she is Chickasaw and the newly appointed special assistant to the president for Native American affairs for the White House Domestic Policy Council. And she was saying, you know, this move is, um, you know, shows that the new president is committed to regular, meaningful, robust consultation with tribes. And this uh, strong process, you know, is needed in place. And, you know, she mentioned that before um, the Obama administration, the Clinton administration had something in place. And so what this uh, executive order does, it just reinforces the executive order from those previous administrations. But what makes it different is this time around, Within the first 90 days, um, these uh, federal agencies and executive departments have to lay out a detailed plan and work with tribes on this detailed plan and also keep the White House updated on, you know, what they're, what's going on. And they have to, you know, listen to tribes and, you know, do what tribes want. And so I think this is going to be um, something different that tribal leaders will see um, in the next four years. And another thing that she mentioned too is, you know, he also um, expanded, you know, tribes access to the strategic national pile. So more uh, resources for tribes to fight this pandemic. And he also increased uh, access, I guess, ensured um, that tribes will receive help federal uh, funding from the from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And so before uh, tribes were responsible for 25% of, you know, the federal cost share and then the federal government was in charge of 75%. But now that's changed to the federal government is going to be responsible for 100% of the cost share. So tribes don't have to worry about trying to come up with that extra 25% um, of the money to get these uh, resources, to get that financial, um, those resources. And like a couple of other like fun <laughs> notes that she told me about was that um, in the Oval Office, the Andrew Jackson painting ha came down. Um, so that's something I think some people point out on social media, but you know we got confirmation that did happen. And then now on his bookshelf is the Swift Messenger sculpture by Alan Hauser, um, and he's you know a native sculptor. And uh, you know that was a story down by the Albuquerque Journal. And I also got to ask about land acknowledgments and. You know what was going on on inauguration day or maybe what that could look like you know with this administration with different events and uh what libby said that that's an ongoing conversation right now and she wants to bring uh you know the hopefully new uh, interior secretary deb holland in on that conversation so we'll see what happens there well we only have about a minute left but i really want to ask you about all the hiring going on yeah, so there is a lot. That's also another thing, right? From you know the very you know, interior secretary to the highest level, you know, of government. That's what the administration said, and that's what um, Libby pointed out. Down to you know just even the traditional and non-traditional jobs. She said this administration is hoping to hire more Native people here. I mean, Libby is one of them. Her position was one that Kim Tihi held before, um, who is now the Cherokee congressional delegate. Um, Karen Driver and also Jody Archambault. Um, and now we're trying to find out who else is going to be, um, you know, in the White House or at least um, working in the interior altogether. Well, uh, you can read the story on IndianCountryToday.com. Thank you, Jordan, for joining us. Yeah, Mark, thank you for having me on. 
And that's a slice of our indigenous world today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.